Oh, Gordon muted. Sorry about that, just because Rachel was breaking up a little bit there. Just to reiterate, um, um, thanks for coming, Matthew. Really appreciate it. And indeed, thanks to everyone for joining us on here. Um, this is um, uh, uh, the fourth one in the series. But brilliant to have um, um, so many joiners. I think Rachel was pointing to, um, we've had some questions beforehand, but if you have any questions, if you just pop them in the chat facility down on the bottom of the screen or wherever it appears on your device, Put questions, there's one, there's a little note there, so put questions here. If you put a question there, um, and then we'll come to them. If there are similar ones, we'll box them up a little bit, and um, bunch them together. Um, and apologies if we've already covered that um, for, some, for some questions that have come beforehand, then we'll probably skip over that. So the, the general flow of this is Matthew's gonna give us a bit of a talk about his way, so to speak, uh, to this point. Uh, maybe pull out a few sort of take homes uh, that he's learned along the way and then we'll go to the questions because um, um, uh, I've known Matthew for a while and um, he's a man of many talents, um, a modern renaissance person so to speak, uh, so um, it would be interesting to hear then um, how he chooses the projects that he, that he takes um, around form or story or, or what's the driving force around that but also then just to hear his path is, is really interesting so lovely to see you Matthew. You too. Yeah, we uh, we shared an office many many moons ago, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man and Playhouse. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having me uh, and for for bringing me to Liverpool, as it as it were. <laughs> um, I, I, what I'm going to say is, I had a little look at Gitika's uh, uh, No One Way. I've got no wonderful slides, uh, <laughs> PDFs. It's just going to be me chatting. I'm afraid. Good. Good. Um, but we'll, we'll kick off. So I um, uh, grew up in East London uh, in poverty. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, and I think it starts to underpin a whole series of, of principles that I, I hold on to and, and, again, kind of inform the work I make. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of born in East London in, in, a, in a fairly poor district uh, and went to a school where the majority of people were also poor. Uh, and because of that, I think I was a uh, a slightly naughty child for a number of reasons, uh, as as were many children, uh, constantly on the edge of of uh, expulsion, detention, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and at some point, I remember doing a drama class in in primary school with a woman called Mrs. Bellamy, and it was kind of amazing. And and I realised that that you could get this sense of reward in, in a slightly different way without just kind of stealing someone's board and running around the playground for 20 minutes uh, and going, hey, look, I've got attention or whatever it is that I'm, I'm needing at this point in time. Oh, I can get it here as well. Um, so I think in a really basic way, like my love of theatre started from, from wanting to show off, which is where I think loads of people's way in starts or a way of expressing yourself or, or holding attention, which feels kind of important. Uh, particularly if, if you struggle to find that elsewhere in your life, I guess. Um, and then I got to, to secondary school and, and I, I chose GCSE as a subject and it was kind of one of the subjects that I excelled in. Uh, I, I think I was interested in, in other subjects, but they weren't, they weren't my go-to, they weren't the thing I naturally lent into, uh, but possibly because of the structure of them. I was fascinated in all of those subjects if they came through a slightly different channel, a slightly different medium. Um, so you know geography and history and science and math and everything but but if it wasn't being kind of taught by rote i guess and if i could find it through stories uh, or experiences then, then i really took to it um at some point someone said to me uh down the road is is a theatre called theatre of stratford east and they have a youth theatre so i wandered down the road on a sunday i think it was with a pound coin in my hand which i'd heard was the, the subs for for the session and i remember peering through this frosted glass and walking away absolutely petrified uh, at, at what I could imagine was inside. Uh, and I went home and my mum said, you get back there and you do that thing. <laughs> uh, so I went back there and I did that thing. Uh, and that, I think that starts one half of the career that I've had, uh, which is a career in theatre. And I think Theatre of Stratford East is a magical, special place uh, that because of um, Joan Littlewood really understood and engaged with its local community. Uh, and again, I think that is another strong principled underpinning of the work that I've gone on to make. Mm. Uh, 
and, and Joan believed in the kind of continuous cycle, uh, which was that you brought community relevant stories on the stage that informed the community, that helped the community evolve, shift, reflect upon itself. And that, will, that community will then offer new stories that again are put on the stage. So you have this continuous cycle uh, ever feeding the community and the art and the community in the art. Um, and of course, it's in a, in a poor district. It was in a massively poor district. It's now in a fairly rich district because of the uh, Olympic development that happened in that area. Um, so there's that. And then on the other side of my life, uh, I start rapping, which will begin to explain the, the wall of records behind me. Uh, and I, I change, I, I write Matthew Zia on my school books, which isn't my real name. Uh, Matthew is, Zia isn't. Uh, and then someone says, what's that weird Exma, Excalibur, Xavier thing you keep writing on your books? And I'm like, oh, Excalibur, that's a good name. Uh, so I become MC Excalibur with two friends and we form a group called Sanguinary. Uh, so pretentious. Uh, <laughs> and we, we're like obsessed with like Kung Fu metaphors and listen to Wu-Tang Clan all day and stuff like that. Um, and then at some point, I either work out or figure out that I'm not enjoying rapping so much. And I, I take a back seat and I become the DJ for the group. And then at some point, they kind of stop rapping. One of them carries on and, and goes off to have a, a hip hop career of his own. Uh, but I really get into DJing and music and composition. And I start trying to make music myself on, on equipment that isn't really set up to make music. Uh, and that sets me off on this other path. Um, and at the point where I go to sixth form college to study performing arts, media studies and English language, uh, I became massively disillusioned with it. I, re I realized again that I wasn't enjoying this kind of being taught by rote thing. Uh, I think I, I had a moment where I expected to be treated more like an adult than I was. And someone said, you're late, stand outside the classroom. And I went outside the classroom and outside the college and then all the way home and said to my mum, I'm not going back. And she <laughs> said, uh, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, give me two years uh, and I'll be a superstar DJ. And if not, I'll go back to back to college she said you got two years uh, so, <laughs> uh, and then within a year I, I joined BBC One Extra uh, and that was for being massively proactive I, I had a pirate radio station I was visiting all the, the big record labels and picking up all the new music so I was slightly ahead of the curve every time and bringing guests on um, and that radio show was heard and basically lifted up and plonked on as the first uh, the first show on One Extra when that started in 2002. So then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be a DJ. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna do. And then this Stratford East, why would this time I've kind of been through their youth theater, I'm now on the board of directors because Philip Headley is a genius and thinks that the young members of the community should be part of the governance. Uh, so he puts me on the board at 18. I say nothing for three years because I don't understand what anyone's saying. Uh, and then I slowly <laughs> start to pipe up. Um, I think I've also been like asked to program some of the bar. So we turn that into a space for, for cabaret and I've run some uh, youth theater like cabaret events. Um, and I had that, that and, and then Alts. So Alts comes into my life and Alts is a renowned theater director, designer, opera designer. Um, and, he, and this is around the same time that I joined one extra. And he says, uh, hey, Matthew, Jay-Z just sampled It's a Hard Knock Life. Do you think that you can sample an entire musical? Uh, and I say yes, which is what I say to most things when people ask me. Uh, most of the time, yes, yes, just give it a go. So we do it and we do it as a youth theatre production and it goes very well. And then Philip Headley has this theory that musical theatre is always 25 years behind popular music. So he says, let's put this on our main stage. So we do it and it's very successful. Uh, and I'm so I'm doing my radio show and then on every, I'm doing the show and then every Thursday night I'm deputizing someone so I can go and do my radio show. So that's my life. Uh, and then I keep on writing music for theatre. So uh, that, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make, I'm going to be a DJ and I'm playing clubs and festivals and doing all of that stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to write music for theatre. And then, oops, again, uh, says, Matthew, I'm working on this play called The Blacks by Jean Genet. Uh, do you... He says it's got these massive kind of poems and arias in it, and I think they share a kind of anger and fury that equates to um, a hip hop that was around in the late 80s and early 90s. So you're kind of really political public enemy stuff, and I guess your West Coast gangster gangster rap. Uh, and so we do the Blacks remixed, uh, and and it gets five star reviews and it gets one star reviews. I've got my own theory about that, which is that it's genius, and some people haven't quite.
I clocked, clocked it, it's genius. <laughs> that helps me sleep at night, I think. Um, <laughs> so I do that, and then, and then he says, I want you to write all the music for it, but I also want you to co-direct it. And I go, I don't know what that means, but I'll sit next to you while you direct it. And he said, that's what it means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so we, I'm, I'm learning from him and he says things like, no, Matthew, you never tell an actor how to say a line. Uh, you have to help them. You know, all these little soft tips that he's giving me, which now make much more sense later on in my life. Um, so 16 years after joining Theatre Royal Stratford East as a young company member, I leave having been associate director, a composer, an actor, a DJ in the bar, a programmer, like every role you could have done in that organisation. I think I had done it. In, a, in an artistic capacity. Um, and then I felt like I was hitting my head against a glass ceiling because I hadn't been enabled to direct any of my own work. I'd always kind of ridden side, side saddle, no, that's what I mean, sidecar, yeah. Um, so then I, I hear about this thing called the Genesis Directors Network. So I join that uh, and an opportunity comes up. And I should say, like, I'd also gone for jobs as like uh, associate, head of contemporary music at the Barbican. Like I, I didn't really know what I was going for, but I was just seeing opportunities and thinking, oh, I think I can do that. And I've got this music world and this theater world and I'll play within those parameters. Uh, and then I also had a bit of a journalism world because I've been invited to write about music quite often. Um, and so I went and did like a postgraduate course at the Guardian for two weeks, which I left after one week because I wasn't enjoying it very much. Uh, again, I just walked out on lunchtime and didn't go back. <laughs> so it's a pattern. If I don't, if I don't like it, I'll, I'll leave. Um, but I wasn't a graduate, and I think that's also important, but I felt like I'd amassed enough experience in other realms that mm. it felt like I could approach this thing. So again, I just kind of went for it and got it. Um, but I'd also gone for loads of things that I hadn't got, and I think that's important to mention because I think when you do these stories, you just you hit all the stepping stones that have enabled you to move forward, but you don't talk about the missteps and the falling into the river. Um, so where are we? I, I applied for this job at the Young Vic, which is to assist the artistic director, David Lan on a show called Blackta by Nathaniel Martello White, uh, which was about like colorism or shadism within the acting community, uh, black British acting community. And I thought, well, this is what I do. I make, I make work about, blackness and about marginalized voices and and all that Stratford East thing you know that's that kind of the work I wanted to make um and I really got along with Sue Emmers and I really got along with David Land and he said absolutely in you come and I I think I interviewed twice for the job and then got it and did it and I think that's really useful uh and when we get onto tips I think again a couple of these things will solidify um so then I hang around on the Genesis network and I'm doing lots of uh workshops and, and little classes and meeting people and, and discovering this whole other world of theatre. But this has an adverse effect on me, which is I start dressing differently, I start talking differently, because I'm suddenly hiding so much of my working class uh, identity. So I start putting T's in the middle of the word water and daughter um, and things like that. Uh, I remember my mum heard me on Radio 4 at some point, uh, and she said, I didn't know that was you talking for 10 minutes. Uh, and then I realised, oh, that's my son, because I was doing this affected speech of how I thought people in theatre should talk, uh, because I wasn't sure that I would fit in otherwise. And and my whole fashion had gone from hip hop to like um, hipster, I guess, <laughs> very quickly. Um, that's I guess that's also useful because I feel like I'm coming out of that again uh, and redefining myself on my own terms. Um, so then I hear about another scheme and it's called the Regional Theatre Young Director Scheme and I apply for that uh, and what that does is it picks you up and it puts you in some theatre somewhere else in the country that isn't where you're from uh, and I thought oh this is a real chance to understand audience and to see if like that Stratford East thing works in exactly the same way that I believe it does elsewhere and what better theatre to kind of go to than, than the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse in, in that regard. Um, and I go, oh, I've got my mates up there because Julia Samuels and Keith Saha are up there. Uh, and Julia used to lead the youth theatre at Stratford East. Uh, my partner at the time, and still my partner, uh, is from Liverpool. Uh, and we're thinking about having a family and her, her family are up there. So there's a support network that might enable this to happen. Um, so I apply for it and I'm very direct in the interview. And I said to the other option which I think was Salisbury Playhouse I don't want to go to Salisbury I don't understand rural venues uh, I very much want to go to a uh, metropolis 
and engage with a diverse community and uh, and continue doing the thing that I'm doing, I guess. Uh, and I think that enamored me to Gemma Bodney quite quickly and she thought, yeah, that'll do. Um, and then I was up in Liverpool and again learning and, and of course it was, it was what I thought it was, but with a different demographic, you work and move and shift and operate in a different way. Uh, I got to make my first piece of work there, which was a piece called Scrappers, uh, up in the studio. Um, and at the same time, I was very cheeky and I applied for the Genesis Future Directors Award, which I shouldn't have done because I was already on a scheme somewhere else. Uh, but as you're learning, I've, I've, I'm a bit gung-ho. Um, so I just went, I'm going to go for it. And I had this wild idea. I wanted to do a play called Sisway Banzi is Dead, which was set in uh, 1974, apartheid South Africa. And I had this idea that you could politicize the audience by segregating them as they came into the building based on their ethnicity or presumed ethnicity. Uh, and I said that in one of the interviews and I remember like a wry smile coming over David Land's face. Uh, and then he tried to trick me and he said something like, well, if you want, to, want it to reference apartheid, why not set it in Palestine? Uh, and I said, that's a dreadful impression of David, isn't it? Uh, but I said, <laughs> um, because I think audiences are clever enough to, to do the maths, you know, to like to apply the historic moment to many current situations. Um, and he said, yeah, very good. And then we did that and it, it went well. And then he brought it back into the biggest space and then it toured. But I think what this means is like, again, I was developing a relationship with David uh, and that remains true to, to this day. Um, I supported uh, you and the wonderful Victoria and Gemma and, and Ruth and then Deborah and that team there in opening the Everyman. So I got this amazing insight into how you reopen a building, uh, the missteps and the mistakes that can, that can happen there as well, uh, and, and the accountability and the transparency which is required for leadership. And I think I'd always known at some point I wanted to be an artistic director because I didn't know what it was, but I knew that whatever Philip Headley had given me, I wanted to give to other people. Uh, as individuals and as communities. So I, I think that's why I went to Liverpool. And then this job came up in Manchester for an associate artistic director. And I thought, well, I've, that's one step closer to the job I want. If I take that word out, associate, then I'm going to do the job that I want to be doing. So I'll do that. And then the next step after that is to shave off this word. So I go to Manchester. And again, I didn't think I'd get the job because I didn't think I had enough experience. And I think people with much more experience had applied and not got it. Um, and Sarah had seen Sisway and really enjoyed it. I'm not sure if she'd seen Scrappers, um, but I think we clicked and I think she enjoyed my principles and my ethics um, and my reason for like doing the thing in the first place. I think that's so important. Um, like why, why are you an artist? Again, we'll come on to the tips in a bit. Um, but so I go there and I do that and I learn how to make work in the round. I learn how to make work in a 750 seat auditorium, I learned how to make big work. I'm, for the first time ever, I would say I'm not making work that is directly about my own identity as a working class human or a, or a brown, uh, marginalized, whatever it is, black human being. Um, so the first thing I did there was Into the Woods, a big, massive musical. Uh, and again, but I think I did, I, those politics were in there in the people looked like the high street, you know, and it kind of felt a bit like the high street and it was in Manchester and it was like you were in a forest in Manchester uh, today or whenever it took place. Um, so we did that and I, again, putting little bits of shift and change in it. Oh, hold on, I'm, I know a wonderful uh, musical director of colour. Is there some way that he can be there so that when we watch the show and we see this wonderful high street and we go great glorious and then we look up at the band, isn't this monocultural shift that we get as we move up? So just trying to apply all those principles at all points and all times. Uh, and then I do Frankenstein uh, with April DeAngelis with the kind of feminist take. I mean, it had a feminist take to begin with, but we hold on to a lot of the feminist take because um, I think that's what it's about and how society marginalizes and, and defines the monster within our society. And, and again, a kind of allegorical take on that. Um, and then after four years, I think, uh, I also, whilst I'm there, I, I create this thing called Open Exchange, which Sarah invites me to do, which is a artist development scheme. Uh, and we get a shit ton of cash from Esme Fairburn, which was amazing, for three years of artist development, which kind of, again, I, like, I was just looking at my 
child at the time walking around falling into the table bumping her head and and working out what you need to do to enable her to bump her head in the right sort of way that she doesn't die but she does learn because i think that's what artist development should be like you go you go right out there and you test something and you make some mistakes uh, but it doesn't ruin you and it doesn't cost you everything uh, as an artist. Because um, I think that's what Sisway was. Uh, so we're nearly at the end of this, this I promise you. Um, uh, Sisway, the first time you do it, there's no press. So I called it the Fuck Up in the Dark Award. Uh, because if you get it wrong, no one knows about it, apart from <laughs> the people who came and saw it over the course of a week, every night. Um, so I was trying to enable people to do that, go fail, fail hard and learn, learn something. Um, and then I moved back to London, uh, which may have been a, a financial mistake. Uh, we'll work that out as, as we move through the next however many years. Uh, but I, because I'm thinking, let me go and freelance again in, in the place that I really know mm-hmm. where there were, there were just many more opportunities. I disagree with that point now because actually I think there are many more opportunities out of London and easier opportunities in some ways out of London. Um, uh, but I guess I, there was a, a yearning to, to go home after five years. Mm. So I came back and I applied for many, many, many artistic director jobs, uh, all of them. If you saw one advertised, I went for it. Uh, and the one that ended up matching was Arti- um, Actors Touring Company, which I've now been running for about a year. Uh, I, you know, it's worth saying I went off and did other things. So I did Blue Orange at the Young Vic again through my relationship with David, uh, which enabled me to work with some amazing actors uh, and massively souped up budget on design so we could build a whole room under a room under a room and all sorts of things. Um, I did an opera for the Barbican and Stratford East. So, I, you know, I was always carrying on doing freelance work whilst doing lots of these other things. Um, I think that then got me this associate position at Nottingham Playhouse, where I had made a play called Shabeen, which is incredibly relevant and personal right now. Um, and a play called One Night in Miami, which again is about, is about civil rights in America and, and systemic oppression. Uh, and then, while that's what happening, I'm still DJing until I moved to Liverpool. Uh, and I moved to Liverpool in 2012. And I stopped DJing because I feel like I've had the biggest gig I'm ever going to have in my life. And there is nothing past it that will give me the reward that gave me uh and again this is all about relationships so danny braverman who used to be head of education at stratford east used to be with and and they have a wonderful child uh with jenny seeley who runs gray eye who was the artistic director of the paralympic opening ceremony so when she says i need a dj she calls me and i end up djing in a stadium for eighty-five thousand people in stratford where i'm from on my 30th birthday and i'm like stop stop this is good i don't know where you get this again um and that felt like a real natural point actually to kind of park that uh, and put all of my attention and energy into theater um and initially com- composition and um sound design but then I think that's just slowly filtered away. And so I think now I am purely a, a director and an artistic director with a massive hankering in lockdown to DJ to a club full of hundreds of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that brings us up to ATC. Uh, and I arrived at ATC uh, a year and a half ago. It's meant to tour international work. I noticed that its internationalism stopped at the borders of Europe, uh, and I was interested in voices beyond that, and also intersectional cross-cultural voices within our country or our nations. Mm -hmm. Um, So I found this piece of work originally in Hebrew by an Israeli writer about being foreign in Europe, particularly in Amsterdam, and the the ghost or the spectre of the Holocaust looming large. Um, and that was a really different piece of work for me. Uh, I would argue that my work has always been very naturalistic with touches of magical realism. And this was like, it wasn't a play, it was a theatrical experience in storytelling and co-creation. Um, so it really stretched me. Uh, quote from Sarah Frankham, as an artist, you should always be working outside your comfort zone. That's where you'll stretch and learn the most. So it feels, um, like I was really doing that. And I think I want to go back to making plays next time uh, with characters and backstories and, and I don't know, a flat or something with a draw. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's where I am. Um, 
and I guess I guess what I wanted to just kind of draw down on from that almighty bleh, uh was that I feel like I've always been doing the same thing, Gordon. I feel like mm-hmm. I've always been doing the same thing. And I remember having an interview with Mark Rosenblatt, uh, and I called him out on this all the time, where he said, your CV is schizophrenic. Uh, and I said, that's an inappropriate use of the phrase schizophrenic. Uh, and also not true. My CV is me, and I'm an artist, and therefore mm-hmm. if I do music, or I write about music, or I... But more crucially, I think what I'm doing, or what I've always been aiming to do, is to create a, a shared experience. Is, yeah. is, and I'm never like the key arbiter, you know, like as, the, as a DJ, I, I take stories, and my stories were always marginalized voices from guys in the ghetto, many ghettos around the world, because I was into international hip hop. Um, but I was telling them, I was just playing their stories to the world and saying, listen to this marginalized voice. And now, and then I go into clubs and I'd shape an evening or I'd shape a radio two hours. And now I shape two hours in a different space, but I get six months to think about it and I get to yeah. work with a collaborative team and think about who that team is to help make that piece. But I, and therefore I can work the moments even finer, I guess. Uh, and then I get four weeks to really make it, uh, if I'm lucky, three uh, push. I'd really concur with that because when I first met you, um, it always felt as if, um, so you meet people who are on RTYDS over the years and they're very much career directors as such. It's that I want to be a director. And this is, and you, of course you want it to be that, but you want it to be your, express yourself and your views. And what I always took home um, from the time we spent together in Liverpool was uh, it's you. There's the work and that's what you achieve. And it's phenomenal when you set it back and think, wow, how, how's this guy doing all this? But it's that it's coming of you. And so often um, you see that in people who, um, who are uh, achieving their dreams as such, that it's, it's because uh, their values, what they think and their actions all sort of align. And so therefore, as you say, however it comes out of you, it's always you that's coming coming through yeah yeah i think that's it. like and i'm not trying to do it subtly either i don't think like own it a, a number of people alt david land philip headley sarah frankham uh Gemma bodney might come up a number of times in this chat because they all say brilliant things all the time um but i remember calling david land for some advice at some point uh when exhibit b happened which was oh, yeah. that kind of I guess it was an ex- exhibition, like a museum exhibition, which had uh, uh, black heritage, African heritage individuals in little dioramas, you know, like little setups, uh, like an ethnic museum. But it was, I think it was absolutely looking at colonial history in Africa. Mm-hmm. It wasn't exploitative because the people who decided to make the show and all made it together in the spirit of, of a united um, endeavor. Um, and I was lucky enough to see it because a friend was in it. So I went along and saw it and I came out kind of in tears going, oh my God, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And then there were the protests and it got shut down. And I tweeted, don't censor art uh, and, and a series of other things about how important the piece of work was. And then I got calls from like, I was in Liverpool at the time, uh, I think when this happened, because uh, I remember standing on the doorsteps near, near Lark Lane somewhere. Um, and I called David and I said, uh, the Evening Standard have been in touch and they want me to speak on this. And I'm, I don't feel like I can speak on behalf of the black community because I don't think there is a unified black community. And I don't, you know, I don't think communities work in, in that sort of way. Um, and he said, okay, Matthew, what do you think? And I said, the three things I thought, which is you shouldn't censor art. It was really important. And the most evident, invisible person in that space was the white colonizer. And that was what the piece was about. Uh, and he said, oh, well, that's probably what you should say then, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and I went, oh yeah, of course it is. Whatever you think, whatever your principles are, live by them. Um, mm. And that underpins the choices in the work. It, uh, it also, it, you know, it also helps me if a, if a piece of work doesn't quite align with my principles, how can I pull it closer to my set of values? Um, so with Frankenstein, again, you know, that cast looked like the world we live in today. And I wanted the, the central figure 
to not be a, a white man. I thought it was really important because we have had that take on that story repeatedly. And I think there was a version touring at the same time as we were doing our version. Um, you know, I thought it was important that the creature, the monster wasn't black or because we weren't doing that. It wasn't doing some explicit kind of version of, of crass metaphor. Uh, small joke that only Vinay Patel can make uh, that I'll share with you uh, is he said, Matthew, there's nothing new about an Asian doctor uh, in casting Shane Zaza as Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Uh, but I thought there was, <laughs> it was a radical move. Um, so yeah, like how can you sneak the politics in elsewhere? The pantomime I did at um, uh, Stratford East, Sleeping Beauty, had non-binary fairies. Why not? What, what gender is a bloody fairy? I have no idea. They're, they're of, of a point of fantasy. They can be whatever. Uh, so then we go, well, what is a non-binary fairy? And so we just took a bunch of gender-based tropes, really, and put them all on every individual so they could be anything, you know? Um, let's tiny little things that just fill me with joy like seeing two small east asian girls in the front row looking up at um sleeping beauty with a bow and arrow looking like a superhero and she's east asian and they're going that's me i could be that you know and um when we talk about uh representation and, and i always think of that juno diaz quote which is i'll, I'll paraphrase dreadfully you know how monsters don't have reflections. You know how vampires don't see themselves in the mirror. Well, like when I was a kid, I felt like that growing up. I never saw myself reflected back culturally. And so I felt like a monster. So I decided when I grow up, I'm going to make a couple of cultural mirrors uh, to enable kids like me to see themselves reflected back and not feel so monstrous for it. And I was like, <clears throat> yeah. And here's how we see it. We just see what it is and what it is to not to be denied that, I think. So where else, you know, wherever I can sneak all that stuff in uh, or, or not sneak it in, be very open about it, then, then I will. So some, some tips, Gordon, unless there was anything else you wanted to unpick within that. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of bits that you said, that, that, so the themes you mentioned, um, Philip and Alts, um, and it feels as if that there were people who, did they see something in you early on, do you think? Or were they seen, or, or was that their general character and they were like that with um, a whole bunch of you that were in and around Stratford East at the time? Or, or, or what do you think on that? Yeah, I think, I think it was, a, I think Philip has always been radical. Mm -hmm. I think Alts has always been radical. Um, you know, like, and, and Clint Dyer was was alumni from that youth theatre as well, and he got me into a film with Armando Iannucci when I was like 16 years old, which I... On the Tube. On, on the Tube, exactly, yeah. Uh, tube Tales, it was called, uh, which I, I recently learned was Armando's first director, it was his directorial debut. Okay. Um, but no, I think what... I think they saw that I had this musical ability, and I thought that was useful to them in various ways. Uh, I remember them just saying, like Philip said something once, which was, I said, oh no, I'm making beats or something like that. And he said, no, 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 Matthew, you're composing. And I was like, wow, fuck, I'm a composer. Uh, you know, and then I've gone on to like write for orchestras and I can't read the stuff I've written for them, but I've done it on a bit of computer equipment. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's like, it is championing of the very best sort, but I don't think it's, um, I don't, I've never felt like I've, other than drive, I don't think I've had anything particularly special. Uh, drive and principles. Um, and I think those are people who've got drive and principles. So I think I've just presented those to people around yeah. me. And they've, they've, and they've thought, oh, I can use that. Or he says interesting things. Oh, that's... And then they've... But I think they've had to take time to get to know me. And I think that's what happened with David. And I think that's what happened with Sarah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened with Gemma. Um, so as soon as I, you know, did the two big tips I wrote down, first of all, were relationships and champions. Yeah. Uh, but they can come out of so many different places. Mm -hmm. um, Dominic Cook is a, is a uh, when, I, when I was going for the job at Stratford East as associate director in like 2009, I think this was, I'd never been interviewed before for, a, you know, a, a high ranking job. So I, 
and thinking, oh, I need to get in touch with someone. So I just emailed like artistic director at royalcourt.co.uk or something like that. Uh, and somehow it managed to get through to Dominic Cook. Uh, and he said, well, come in and I'll, do, I'll give you a mock interview. So I went in and he, over 45 minutes, he asked me a bunch of questions where at any point I could just go, oh, I haven't thought about that, Dominic. What should mm -hmm. I say? And he said, well, you should think about this. And you should think about this. And I think there are so many people that are willing to help in this industry. Um, not all of them. And I think, yeah, it's hard to work out. You know, I often talk about like the way I run an audition. And then people go, wow, really? That, that's never been my experience in an audition room. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry people aren't more conscientious of the work and the relationship that is taking place in that, in that moment. You also mentioned, so this was quite early on when you were about to join the youth theatre, and I'm going to paraphrase you as well, you were, or your mum, that you were looking in through the window as such and you felt, um, you felt frightened and that um, your mum said, go and get that thing, and you did, and you went back. Um, now, I've never thought of you as someone, I thought, I thought of you as someone quite fearless, really, mm. and I've known you to be quite fearless, and I don't know if that's, a, um, if that's true or not, but do you think that's a turning point for you or do you also think that there are still windows that you look through and you have fear but because you've the principles because you've um uh this this proactive nature and because you listen to others and you communicate well with others and uh, share well with others do you think that's what helps you go through those uh through those those doors or those windows that frighten you you're the second person to say something like this in the last like two weeks uh the other person said, I'm brave. It's just weird because I don't feel brave. I don't feel fearless. Uh, okay. I feel uh, quite often scared and fearful uh, yeah. of, of all this. You know, like two years into my job as associate artistic director of one of the biggest cultural institutes in, in the North, in the Royal Exchange, I would still stand outside a door and go, it's okay, Matthew, you're meant to be in that room. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the door handle and go through. Yeah. And, you know, I think like, I keep trying to, and everyone has got a million stories, haven't they? But you know, like imposter syndrome is massive for me. Uh, and I think it is for many people, depending in, in all sorts of walks of life and classes and, and wherever you come from. Um, but what I've realized recently uh, is that I'm not from the working class, I'm from the survival class. Uh, my mum okay. was a survivor, which means, uh, and, and members of my family, which means sometimes they were working class, sometimes they were benefit class. Sometimes they may have been criminal class. And those, you know, because they just did whatever they had to do to make sure there was food on the table and the rent was paid. Um, so I think I've got a bit of that in me. And I think that's why I, I became a bit of, uh, to use your word, a kind of Renaissance man. Um, it's because I just did whatever would pay the bills. So I would, at the same time, I'd be writing a little thing for SOS magazine, a little hip hop fanzine. I was just writing a bit of music for that theater company that's doing that thing, mm -hmm. uh, reading someone's script and giving them notes on it, and then doing the gig at the end of the week that gives me another 60 quid. And you know, uh, if I took all of those various things, I managed to sustain a, a freelance career. If, if I didn't have one of them, I wouldn't have worked, I don't think. Um, so I think that's what it is. Like, what's the other, what other option is there? Mm. You know, like I, I, I decide upon a goal and I, I think about what things in a really soft way, you know, what do I need to do to get there? How many years do I want to give myself or what, what's the time frame of trying to get there? And now head for it, but it's never, it's never coldly strategic, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, you can see that in a way as well, that you, you, um, you benefit from the opportunities that come up in place as well. So you mentioned where the, uh, you were on one placement, but sort of Genesis come up and thought, right, I'm going for that. I'm sure yeah. when you took the RTYDS, you didn't think, you thought, right, I'm exclusively going to do this, but you saw an opportunity. And so therefore you don't build that into a strategy as such. Um, but also you, you by having a vision, you then stumble across the strategies. So you could go, oh, right, um, Genesis or RTYDS, those schemes suddenly become apparent to you. Um, uh, and we see this in lots of careers that you, because you have a vision, but you, I, I didn't know about certain schemes like that until 
until I heard about them because I, you know, theatre wasn't anything that I was aware of as as a child or as a young person. So it's only through. Oh, cool. you know, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. And if it was, yeah. it only wasn't a thing that was for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think probably be really good to go over to questions. There's going to be tons, Matthew. Oh no, no, give us some, give us your tips. My tips. Your tips. Well, yeah, I've yeah. Touched on two of them. I think relationships, real, truthful, honest relationships. And you can't pitch a relationship. You've got, you know, it's it's a it's a subtle, developing, evolving, magical thing. Uh, so you can't strategize having a relationship. I didn't. Again, I didn't know that Sue Emma's, who I was petrified of, the first four times I met her, would go on to become one of my, you know, dearest friends. Uh, you just talk and put yourself in places that are more likely to make a relationship possible, yes. I guess. Um, so that's the first thing. And But also not just relationships with people. Something Sue said really early in my career, just as I'd left Stratford East, was, um, Matthew, if you want to make work at the Young Vic, you might want to hang around at the Young Vic a bit more than you do. You know, like, don't just come for the opportunity. Uh, the relationship has to, again, and this will probably move into the third tip. So champions come out of relationships, of course, mm -hmm. and again, you can't earn a champion. Out of a relationship, someone will see your value, uh, your difference, your uniqueness, uh, and they will work out how best to support that, to position you, to encourage and push you. Um, but ultimately, one of the big things for me is like the Venn, and this is what I got from Gemma Bodney. Like, I've never even heard the word Venn diagram. I think she uses it four times in a in an hour. Uh, so I was like, what what is this Venn diagram? And it's those two looping circles that we've seen drawn down in a bit in the middle. So one of those is you and your principles and your ethics and your aesthetics and your taste and your vision, and the other bit is the organisation or the funding body or the stage that you're hoping to make some work on or get some money from or, or people you want to work with and again for me if there isn't a big healthy chunk in the middle mm. not going to work so when you go in and you know so often people are i don't know like maybe you might get it uh people come to you and they go um right gordon uh arthur miller the crucible right i want to do it at the unity and you go whoa 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 that's not really what we do like let's have a do you want to hear what we do <laughs> you know like it's a two-way thing and i think it it's the two halves of something clicking together that is essential for you to move in the same direction, I think. So yeah. very often people just come in and coldly pitch from their position, but without understanding your position. So yeah. again, in like, I think I laid out my cards very clearly in that meeting with Gareth Matchin and Gemma Bodling. I said, I don't get r rurality, the countryside. And I've been there very rarely. It scares me. Uh, I like cities. I feel safe. Um, and again, instead of kind of going, look, there's me, there's me, there's me, here's me, here's me, here's me, we can now very quickly have a much more useful conversation. If I come to you and I go, I'm really interested in, in uh, classical theatre, Gordon, and, um, and mask work, or, you know, or something, <laughs> we go, that's not, you know, I've said it, it's that. Uh, yeah. And then my big thing is like the why, and this has been an ongoing question for me, um, and it's an evolving question. Why is this how you're spending your time? Why is this how you're, why is this where you're putting all of your energy? In more practical scenarios, why that play? Why you? Why here? Why now? Uh, four questions I ask about any piece of work. Um, why, why that content? Why that form? Why do they work together? How do I tease that out in a production? Um, should I? Is that the, the best way forward? Um, and what, I had this theory of like, whying yourself into a into an existential philosophical wormhole like keep going down levels like a four-year-old why because of this but why go down another level but why uh so um i want to make theater why because i love stories like you know it's the shittest answer anyone can ever give in an interview i love the power of stories yeah we know that and that's why we all do it let's go down 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 and, and then that can keep evolving. I'm really fascinated when I talk to artists, what it is in them that they are moving through, expressing, hoping to do to the world, in the world. Um, 
because I think you know sometimes again you see maybe it's what what Mark Rosenblatt was getting at. You look at someone's CV. I'm not talking to you. Watch. Um, <laughs> you know, but something you can feel quite scattergun, I guess. And I guess when I talk to someone, if, if their CV does present as a uh, scattergun, um, for them to be able to draw all the lines between the bullets and go, no, of course, Matthew, the reason that that is my body of work is because, blah. Um, again, don't feel like you're going to land on that answer today or tomorrow. Uh, I, th I think it's really hard. So it's, it's sort of question I talk to my therapist about, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why am I doing the things I am doing mm. in the world uh, you're not I, the only one <laughs> no exactly exactly yeah. we've got to keep asking and i yeah. think you know the the, the, the events and of, of where we find ourselves now um i think i've always been working secretly to, to dismantle systemic relate uh, relationships no systemic racism but way before i even knew what that was mm. i think when you look at all the work that's what it all is all attempting to do in some yes. way um or power structures or class structures, um, mm. which are the two things I find bind me, you know, mm. in the world. They're the things that I'm judged upon the moment I walk into a room and open my mouth. Uh, mm. So I guess I'm fighting that, but it's taken me a long time to, to get to that. Or, or to then go, well, why, why into the woods and Frankenstein as well as this, this much more clearly explicit work tackling these subjects? Mm. Thank you. Should we go to some questions? Because there's going to be, be tons. Um, so from Andrea, she's written, uh, love the Dominic Cook story. Uh, you mentioned that an artist should be stretched and out of their comfort zone. As a Mexican-born female director, I always feel outside of my comfort zone. And at times it's draining. Can you talk a bit more about being outside of your comfort zone? Yeah. Um, so I guess, like... I, I often feel out of my comfort zone again. Uh, sometimes I feel very safe within my comfort zone. Uh, and I think that's like, the comfort zone for me is um, clear, almost Hitchcockian storytelling uh, in backstory, intentions, objectives, moving people around the stage, making pictures, that's, all, that's comfortable. The, the building blocks of a story, the musicality of piece, they're things I feel comfortable with. Uh, so doing Amsterdam, a piece which had none of that at all, it's like flying by the seat of my pants in every moment, uh, having tiny little skirmishes with actors over something I know to be true, but I can't quite explain why it's true this time round. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough to fall back on. Uh, so I might quite quickly get defensive and say, um, because I've told you that's how you've got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's the clearest way, you know, I've been down, I, this was an hour long conversation, I must point that out, I've been down many avenues and we eventually ended up because that's the clearest possible way and that's how I'm telling you to do it as your line manager, thank you very much. Um, but like, we had to invent rules. Uh, another time I felt massively out of my comfort zone or out of my depth was into the woods. I had all the component parts, I knew how to do pictures on stage, but for the first time I was doing it in the round. Mm -hmm. um, I knew how I knew what music was, but not how to make it work in a musical of that scale. Uh, and I suddenly had 19 actors looking at me for yeah. answers and asking me questions. Um, I guess I, I, I relied on lots of support and knowledge of other people. I remember when I first watched David Lan, one of his responses to many people in the rehearsal room, and I don't think this is always good, but was to say, I don't know. And that was massively empowering. So someone would say, David, what does this mean? Uh, and you say, I don't know, let's, let's tackle it. You know, let's all, there are many brains. And I think, I think that's the thing, no, no, as far as I'm aware, no theatre pursuit is an individual endeavour. And so, it, the, you know, I had amazing musical directors, I had an amazing designer, I had an amazing um, movement director, a choreographer, and I can lean into all of those people and their expertise. Now, what is my role within this? Um, similarly with Amsterdam, I kind of knew what I didn't want it to be. And I think that's just as useful um, to help me work it out. We did some workshops. Um, I think what it really means uh, is trust the process. I think that's what it really means. It's like when you get to the end of making a thing and you go, 
oh, if I could go back to the start, I'd make this differently. Well, you, of course you would, because you've made it now. Um, so you can't, that's not possible. So you have to look at the thing you've made and understand that was the process which enabled you to make that thing. It could be no different mm. because it hasn't been any different. And if it has been different, then it changed at some point within it. And therefore it is the thing it is. It's like, I think we, we find ourselves despairing in the middle of a rehearsal process, two weeks in, three weeks in, oh, it's not quite, I don't know, I'm very practical. Uh, what is the problem? Why is it not working? What am I not happy with? What don't I like? What can I foresee? Uh, when can I hear the sweet rappers starting to open two weeks from now when there's an audience sitting with this piece? Um, you know, that, that Peter Brook quote, uh, your job is to sit there and work out why, when it's boring, why it's boring and fix it. <laughs> you know, I, I just love those yeah, yeah, yeah. simple, practical targets. Uh, Joe Hill Gibbons in that Russ Hope book, uh, New Beginnings says, you only need to be ready for the tech by the tech. You know, you don't need to be ready for the dress rehearsal by the tech. You don't need to be ready for preview one by dress rehearsal one. Like, mm. you know, give yourself the time and the process to phase towards each bit. Take stock, see what it is, go to bed, wake up, <laughs> off you go. Like, I think sometimes we try and conceive of the entirety. That, that Peter Brook um, um, quote that you said, that that's so important because actually that's something that gets lost for many uh, uh, directors as they're starting, or writers or so on, it's when are the sweet rappers going to <laughs> come out? Um, and, uh, and that gets forgotten because it becomes a little self-indulgent. I think there's something about remembering the audience uh, because that's the form you're taking, yeah. really. This is it, like, I mean, again, why? Why do you want to make work that, that only happens whilst the people are there watching it happen? Why is that the thing you want to do? Um, and if you don't, go and make film, you know, if you want to have more control over the final thing, go and make film or, or write a novel. Like there are so many ways to get the, the thing out, the creativity out, I guess. Um, so here's a exactly. question from Emma, um, Emma Bramley. How can we better support Northern working class theatre makers during this time and after? What changes do you feel need to happen at your level to support us? Um, so that's quite specifically here from from here, and I, I I'm not sure, but you you do seem to see how to support others, <laughs> you know, who um, feel a lack of support. So I wonder if that you can see any sort of parallels for sort of that northern working class theatre makers who feel a little unsupported at uh, at various points. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I'm kind of. I'm not going to delineate the country by by north or south, but I do understand that that there are there are differences economically. There are differences yeah. uh, the way places and regions are funded. Um, but what I felt when I was in the north as a working class theatre maker uh, was that there was a shit ton of opportunity because because so often you're working with people who are already sharing similar principles to you. Um, the thing I found, so when I said earlier, I think I made a mistake in moving back to London. It's so expensive to live in London. And so for that year and a half, I was freelancing before I started making money again. I just thought, I wish I was paying half the rent. And mm -hmm. when I was living in Manchester, I was paying half the rent for exactly the same house. I'm pretty sure it's the same ground plan and everything, you know. Um, and so I think kind of stay where you are, but understand that the North is a network, a massive network. Uh, and if you want to be successful, I think, find your home spaces, find your home territory, whichever, you know, whichever theatres you absolutely are alive with and can and build strong relationships with. But be prepared to work across those cities. I, you know, and that's what I love, the kind of Sheffield, Leeds, Hull, Newcastle, Humberside, Liverpool. Manchester, uh, um, some of the smaller cities as well, like Doncaster, again, they've, they've, there's so much going on. Um, moving up into Cumbria, Theatre by the Lake, I was fascinated by the kind of range of opportunity, I guess, mm. um, that was there. And then I think, again, find ways of attaching yourself to schemes, if possible. Schemes for me have, have opened every single door, and it's been quite interesting that the, the person stood at that door has been Sue Emma's in most cases. Okay. Uh, so when I went for the Genesis Awards, Sue Emma's, RTYDS, Sue Emma's, uh, the very first gig with David Land, Sue Emma's. Um, and I think there are a couple of people, some of them are 
she's working on it. Uh, petrifying. <laughs> uh, but they, they, I mean, really get in touch with Sue Emmers. She's a Northern working class woman who champions you. <laughs> yeah. She wants you to be in more positions of power in more places across the country. Well, that's it. We, we often invite um, theatre directors or so on to come and see our work. Actually, it is also being known by the likes of Sue or people that are running schemes with JMK or even, you know, for us, we've set up this uh, talent development programme um, that's going to be rolled out. This is part of it, but a broader one that's rolled out. If you can get yourself on those schemes, it doesn't mean you have to be exclusively on that, you know, and schemes take various different guises. You know, we, we um, work with 20 Stories High on this programme called Launch, um, which people it's a year long commitment, but you don't have to be there every day or day every day. You can still go and do your job as such. And it's for multiple people. So I, I think those schemes are, are vital really. Yeah. Um, and how to have some concrete goals as well. What is it, yeah. what is it you want to be doing in four years time? Do you want to be touring the rural network? Do you want to be making work in, in subsidized houses? You know, like where, I guess, where do you see yourself? Do you want to run the national? If you want to run the national, what are the nine steps that you might need to take uh, to go for that incredibly competitive yeah, yeah. gig, you know? Sounds like there's something on the cards there for you, Matthew. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, 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 wanted it, I wanted it once and then I've seen, uh, it's like watching the, the uh, pre-presidential Obama and post-presidential Obama, isn't it? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's actually, that's another really good tip is that your, your objectives change as you go along. Yeah. And interest can come back as we're more, I think you mentioned um, how it sounds like you want to get um, back to music much more yeah. and how when we allow a little more authenticity in our lives, that the things that we love can come through. So um, and I think that's happening for a lot of people during this period yeah. of lockdown um, it, it is that where there's a bit of still and the, the, that wheel isn't going around quite so quickly for some people for others it absolutely is but for some it isn't and that leaves room for your true loves to come through as well a little bit so yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to some questions yeah, here hobbies and, um, and they're slightly more practical what um what is your approach to casting uh find the the right person for the job. No, no I don't know. What, the, <laughs> what is my approach to casting? I, I suppose it's. Um, well, you mentioned the audition process. Yeah. Um, that that you 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 perhaps do it in a way that others aren't aware of. So, in terms of casting, do you have people in mind initially? Do you go to spotlight? Do you go and see people, or how, how do you how um, do you do? So I very often work with a casting director. Uh, we have a very clear conversation where, and I also work with a writer to go. Do you, do you feel any of these roles are bound in any way by protected characteristics? If they're not, I'll go far and wide. Um, and that means they have to be absolutely kind of essential to the story and, and the mechanized, the mechanics of the, of the storytelling, I think, you know. Uh, and then I make a breakdown and I give it to my casting director and, and they go out into the world. And, and I often work with people who I know get me. <laughs> and understand what it is I'm trying to do without me mm -hmm. having to be explicit about it very often or be explicit about it. You know, when I'm doing Shabin, uh, I was saying to Sophie Parrott, um, I think they, I think on the main, we have to have Caribbean actors. I don't think we have, I, I think African actors don't work in the same way uh, because I'm trying to draw upon a particular heritage in this piece uh, that it is very much about. Um, and then within that, there was room to play. Uh, when people come in, I move with absolute kindness. I want every single one of them to get the job. I want, honestly, like I, th I think directors have this power play where they suddenly mm. become Simon Cowell sat behind a desk and they, they get to make decisions in people's lives. Yeah. Don't be a dick, like just be kind and, and hope that every person you have invited in is gonna be better than the last one you know or whatever that's and it's your job to get them there it's your job to give them the right direction and instruction in the room you're not uh auditioning them on how well they can remember something they were given yesterday night you're not auditioning them on whether they knock their bottle over you're not auditioning them on which piece of uh political 
reference material they bring in that they think connects them to the play in some way. Yeah, yeah. You're pushing them on whether they're kind, whether they're talented, whether they can do the job. And I think it's that simple. Um, so I, I often do three things. Uh, I have a, a fairly big chat about the work and the piece and them at the start, which isn't um, full of you know empty gestures. I really want to know if they get what it is I'm trying to do and if I like them as a, you know, we're going to the Big Brother house for, for two months. We've got to get along with each other. Yeah, yeah. And we've got to be united in our focus. Um, so that is always really genuine for me. Uh, and I got it wrong on a play called Scrappers once upon a time, uh, where someone said something that I should have picked up in the audition and I didn't. And then we had uh, a clash later on in the rehearsal process. Um, the second thing I do is ask them to do a reading. And they do a reading. Uh, and often they do that cold and sitting down. And I say it can be a reading. I don't need to see that you've memorized it. And they do that. And I'm looking for the choices they've made. And then I want to know if they're adaptable. And that's it. Uh, and it's that simple. And I think often you get these things where a director will kind of get someone to the right point and they go, can they do it? Yes, yes. they'll tick all the boxes. Uh, you know, they make them jump through the hoop as it were. And then they go, lovely, thank you very much. And then they set the hoop on fire and then they juggle two hoops and go, can you still jump through it? And it's like, you don't need to do that. Let them go and call them back. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can have a more useful uh, conversation, a longer conversation. But I think my big thing is kindness and, and understand, please, the power dynamic that is already so evident in the room. Understand the work that they have done. Understand mm. that they were up all night trying to cram this bit of text into their head and make choices. Yeah. So yeah, don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's brilliant. And uh, I always think that, uh, so I interviewing people, as you say, if you take the kindness approach, one, because they've come to the effort to see you, you want to give a good impression of yourself as well. But also, and the old adage, well, at some point, they might be looking to employ you. And so therefore, if you've been a complete and utter towards yeah. them, <laughs> then... Uh, then uh, chances are that she might be on the other foot at some point. Yeah. Um, just quickly on casting, tiny, a sentence, I think. Um, of course, bodies are political. Mm. Bodies in space are political. Uh, take that into the work you do, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll take one from the Zoom chat then. And do you think more, th ah, this is interesting, giving um, what you've done with streaming with ATC um uh, of amsterdam your your latest piece so do you think more theater will be using streaming to reach more diverse audiences post covid i hope so but not at a detriment to the live event um yeah yeah i think lots of this has kind of flattened some of those hierarchies on or knocked them down slightly uh so people are getting into rooms with people that they they have previously struggled to get into rooms with uh I've loved it. I've loved being able to see things I've missed uh, or that I've wanted to share with people. So like when uh, Complicity's Encounter rocked up online uh, with, a, with a clever little trick at the start of it. Thank you, Simon McBurney. You know, I was sharing that far and wide and going, and I, and I think what it is, I guess what I don't quite get is why we can't, because there's ephemeral, like, and we do capture it now, quite, often quite badly in misshapen bottles, uh, but they should be available, I think. You know, like, you can go to the Royal Court. Anyone can go to the Royal Court and, and watch any of their productions, but you've got to sit in their building and watch it for yeah. a number of complicated rules around the, the IP and the work. Um, so, yeah, but I'm really keen to get back into the shamanic ritual of sitting around the campfire. Really yeah. I, I think two things on that. You, you mentioned the Royal Court there. I, um, as a like when I first started getting into it, I couldn't necessarily afford to go to the theatre. So I'd go to the National Theatre bookshop and I would sit and read the books before I got kicked out. Um, uh, because that was the, that was the uh, way of getting a, an introduction or, you, um, or Complicity's Archive. You'd watch a video, an old VHS of what they've got to yep. get an essence of it because if you can't get that interaction and i think that's what the streaming affords people it is uh, i mean fortunately at unity we have really cheap tickets or comparatively cheap tickets so it is pretty accessible but some certain productions you can't go and see so i think this would open up that opportunity for people yeah i think bit. how do you um 
so many productions that I see that have been captured, mm. like they capture the production, but they don't capture the soul. The no, soul no, no, really right. um, and the soul was definitely there in the room, you know? And it's like, mm. how do you... That's so the that's same with scripts. Sorry? I think, that was my, I think that was my point on scripts. The soul isn't in the script. The, sc- the soul it comes alive from the collaboration of everyone and in that moment and the shared experience that you spoke of. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it will... I don't think it will replace. I think it can, but I think there is a demand for a blended approach. Yeah. It's just how, how do you want to We don't understand what we got was, I love seeing the streaming. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd love to be in the room. You know, that the, it didn't put people off wanting to be there. It made them more keen to be in that space, I guess. So some of the other questions we've got here, I think you've, um, you've really touched upon them already. Um, best way to build connections and who so you spoke you've spoken in depth here's one then so you have had those people down your career such as philip Oates, um sarah and so on but in terms of forging new relationships when you go from one organization to another you're often starting fresh yes you've got those people that have championed you in the past but they might not be able to champion you in this new forum or this new setting so in terms of building new connections uh how do you, how do you go about building those new connections and it's just a really practical one should we email work to prom- to programmers directors or producers to get our work seen how how do you get your ideas basically you want to make connections to get your ideas across how do you go about doing that gosh so i'm now trying to place my part of my mind back uh to yeah. I guess when I was doing it and I didn't have the, the bag of plays. Yeah. Uh, but also thinking how I've done it now. Uh, so I feel like I'm building new relationships with a couple of people at the moment. Um, I, I really, I don't know, like how do you build a relationship? I think, I think it's that yeah, yeah. question, you know, like, and I think at the moment it's really hard to build authentic relationships because we're doing all of these weird, uh, you know, devoid of the ability to kind of, look off and think for a minute, uh, you, you hear intensely, you can't read body language, you don't have all those soft, subtle skills that you rely on in the real world. Um, but I guess without, without being crass, I think it's the same as how, you, how a new friendship starts, yeah. but, it's, but it's, it doesn't need to be that intense. <laughs> you, know, no, no, no. you don't find yourself on the phone to them because you clicked over something uh, in the pub whilst talking to another friend, and now you're phoning them every week. It's not that, I think it's, I think it's where are the shared moments around which you can gather. Um, what's, you know, what you, I feel like sometimes people build, I, I'm not very good at this, but people build relationships on Twitter in a slightly unusual way, where you start to get a sense that there's a bit of a conversation happening between two individuals. Uh, and then an email will come and they go, actually, can we talk about that thing? And an email will come and they go, yes, we can talk about that thing. And then a Zoom happens. And then they go, oh, well, I can't wait to have a cup of coffee with you. And, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's that sort of stuff. And it's yeah. slow and it's organic and you can't rush it and you can't make it. Um, the crass version I was going to say is it's a bit like dating, isn't it? Like, yeah. like if you reach across the table and hold their hand too soon, you've, you've kind of fucked it. And <laughs> you put them off for life, you, yeah, pervert, yeah. Um, you know, back away, <laughs> whatever it is. But like, so again, you've got to be able to it's a dance anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. Dance, and it's a brand new dance where neither of you know the steps but you've both done some old dances what can you bring from that um and i think some real simple things honesty transparency who are you why do you do the things you do how can you demonstrate that where have you ever, ever evidenced that previously um and it's that venn diagram you mentioned again that it's got to connect because otherwise if you're going to be spent and again as you mentioned in the rehearsal room if you don't connect if there isn't that sense of then why why do you want to spend your time working with this person and i've had it where it's been like over here um and and you get that sometimes when you work in institutions a little bit more where you are placed in positions where your um your values don't necessarily align with someone as such and that happens we see that in the workplace much more readily uh, than in potentially creative projects as such. But if you've got that luxury of working on a creative pr- project, then make sure you're doing it with someone that you're going to get along with and you, or you have shared values. You might brush up against each other a little bit. But that might lead to creation, <laughs> you know, but 
this have is shared you objectives. You can be united in your direction, but and and the fights and the skirmishes, uh, to use some too violent language. <laughs> Uh, yeah, will challenge the work and make it better. I think as you move yeah. towards the end goal. Um, here's here's one then for you. Would you create a, a devised non-scripted piece? You spoke about wanting to get back to scripts and, and and that. Are you tempted by you've obviously journalism, acting, music, composer. So, is there a, a actually? Let's move this on a bit. Is there another art form? that appeals to you um now you've had this period as a director is there another art form to express yourself that you're you're interested in there is i'm like i don't feel like my skills lie i feel like there are much better people who do that work uh to talk about the devised collaborative stuff um i i, I do that and i like doing that sort of work in when i'm more participatory focused i guess yeah um but even then i, I will have a writer work alongside so as we're developing and building material someone's shaping it into slices of brilliance uh so it's not not too loose i guess um god do you know what gordon i've um i've always had i think you might have noticed a love of illusion and magic yeah uh, yeah I remember. yeah that's a blast from the past mystery um so I've been reinvestigating some of that i've start i've got i'm doing a every sunday at one o'clock a former mind reader, uh, not Darren Brown, different one, uh, is, is teaching tarot online. So I go and I, I do an hour of learning. We learn one card every week. And this isn't some like uh, spiritual awakening. I think, I think it's just that having done Amsterdam, I've become really interested in symbols mm -hmm. and what people infer from symbols, which I think is what lots of our work is about. So I was like, oh, well, what is that? I think that's useful. Not as a fortune telling tool, as a, as a, you know, there's a way of looking at symbols and applying them to life and going, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I hadn't thought about that like that. Um, and then I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by, and I've never quite got there, the idea of developing a show that uses lots of magic and mind reading and, and that world of stuff, but to present something that doesn't appear to be that. Yeah. Um, Did you see um, Ghost Stories? Were you yeah. around at that time? Yeah. yeah. That, because that was the bloke um, who directs um, Andy Nyman, who directs him. Uh, well, he was... directs all of Darren's shows, doesn't he? So, yeah. yeah. And I, that was, again, when I, they, they employed an actual uh, magician. Uh, you know, how you know you have a designer and you might have a fight director. Yeah. No fight director on this, it was a magician. Yeah. And the same bloke worked on uh, the Lady Killers as well, I think. It was all about, um, it's about direction, of course. It's about where you focus people's attention while something else happens. Yeah. Uh, but I was fascinated was, by that. When we did Frankenstein, uh, there was the op op option to like spend two and a half grand on an illusionist or to put that money into the prosthetics that we wanted to really go to town on for the creature. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Stones, the designer, also has a massive love of illusion, but big illusion, okay. like cabinets and boxes and beds. Uh, and I have an uh, interest in the more psychological end of it. So we were like, I think we can do this. So we yeah. didn't have an illusion consultant and just through our minds at it. Here's another one then from Dom. You talk about the drive you've always had. Is there any advice you have for people who this drive doesn't come naturally to? At drama school, I was often told to give myself permission, never quite knowing what that meant. Um, yeah, any, anything you could point towards on that at all? Only that is things I'm learning. Uh, and I don't know, again, if this is tied in with class or not, but... I've never felt entitled to anything. Uh, uh, Jeff James, a brilliant director from a different class uh, and background to me. You know, he talks so eloquently about the, the fact that the artist never needs to ask for permission, ever. They just, they do the thing they do and they can do anything they want because they are an artist. That sort of language petrifies me. So um, I, th I think my drive has always come from, an, like I say, a, a deep seated, desire to leave a mark or to like I think it's still connected to that child needing attention in some way uh, and then the promise I made my mum that I'd survive on my own two feet out in the world without any formal education mm -hmm. so part of it is necessity I think um, and I think of things like uh, he's slightly odious isn't he but David Mamet said um, don't have the safety blanket 
if mm. you have a safety blanket, you'll invariably fall back into it. That's why you put it there in the first place. Yeah. If you don't have, you know, it's all right, I can, I can be a teacher if I'm not, or it's all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do my PGCE, or uh, it's okay, I can always go back into arts admin, or whatever the thing is you don't want to do that you do want to do, remove those other elements, and it means you have to fall forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you can generate drive, because I think, I don't know, like part of that is about whatever chemicals are operating in your brain at whichever particular season in the year, and, and many other external and internal factors. Um, so I think it's being more truthful and realistic about yeah. your goal and the time frame in which you want to give yourself to achieve it and mm -hmm. the scale and size of the goal, ultimately. And you had that when you were, uh, left sixth form. And I know as well, you said you didn't graduate, but you are a doctor. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that you gave yourself that time frame. You, and um, you had to fall forward because you didn't want to go back. And I think there is that sense of there's that. You can put those things in yourself. And you can also change the narrative in your head and say, well, okay, I think I don't have drive. doesn't mean I don't have drive. Yeah. But I think I don't have it. And then listen to what else might come up when you get rid of that thought. And some motivation may come from deeper within rather than just listening to the stories that we tell ourselves in our head. Yeah. And, and if you genuinely don't have drive, then maybe it's not the right idea, you know? Like, what's the thing? That, the, the things I discover, I have to put them on the earth. I think that's, like, they, they give me fire. There, there are so many plays that I've got scribbled down that I can't get the rights to, or someone else has done to recently, or things yeah. I'm like, I want to do that. And it's yeah. yeah. uh, And if it's, not, if it's not connecting with that bit of your passion, push that thing to the side and, and find the other thing, I think. Also, you can, I just can ask for. You can, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, like, you can you can literally write down. Um, by the end of this week, I must have done these four things. Yeah, and that's not faking drive, but it might get you towards the things that someone with the drive would have done in the same amount of time. And I think that's valuable in this period because what we've noticed in terms of the lockdown, what we've noticed is that um, previous um, um, sessions have been, "What are you doing in this time?" Yeah. Uh, uh, because there is a sense of give yourself a bit of a list if you don't achieve it all don't give yourself a hard time but there is something to, to work towards during this I don't think there are any more questions on there and I certainly um, haven't any more because you answered everything so brilliantly um, I just wondered are there any sort of final points you you just wanted to say at all or are you done only uh, other than the one I'm banging on about uh, with every breath I have, yeah. uh, dismantle systemic racism everywhere you find it, call it out, call out power dynamics everywhere you find them, uh, expose people who are misusing them, abusing them, talk kindly and gently to those who don't know that that's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think that it feels, it feels like right now there's a, a moment of change occurring mm -hmm. that I think we can, I don't want to say capitalise on because that makes it sound mercenary uh, and I don't mean capital as in money but I think to affect some, the sort of change we've all been dreaming of and asking for for quite a time. This moment to stop, pause, reflect, regroup, reimagine, I think allows us to do that. Um, sorry, so someone said something earlier that I, there was just a really practical solution for which I didn't answer. Um, so that's my, my big go out into the world and do this thing. Uh, how do you get people to see your work? Well, I think once you're back in a world where work is a thing and you're making it and people can see it, Please invite a couple of people from an organization, not just the AD, who's often very busy, uh, and please invite them at least a month before your thing is going to open. Um, I get emails two days before, which is when the director has enough faith and confidence in their own work to invite me along, at which point I can't rearrange childcare, that press night, or that other thing. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that, like, because uh, I think very often we want to see your work or we want our associates to see your work or our literary managers, whatever it is, but we're not given enough time to respond accordingly. So That's that. really good advice. That's good advice. Share it out amongst other people. Don't just go to the sort of one person who's seen as the, as the gatekeeper as such. Get it out to as many people as you can. Because, it, you know, if you can't see the work, you may end up then talking to one of your colleagues. And, and hearing great things about something. 
Yeah. Um, I remember that happened with Ridiculousness, uh, th- uh, who would just starting out, and they were always writing. I was working with Complicity at the time. They were always writing to them. It was the education manager who went along to see them, mm-hmm. which then gave them a bit of a boost. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then also in terms of um, Black Lives Matter as well. Thank you for everything that you um, have been championing throughout your life, ever since that primary school lesson as such, yeah. where you wanted to uh, tell the stories of people uh, and, and show off, as you mentioned. So thank you for everything that you say and proactively do around that. Um, I think it's something that, um, uh, it's a real opportunity for people to raise their, I don't know, this is the way I'm viewing it, but for me, it seems an opportunity to raise our, there's an awareness around it not just assume that um, because we aren't um, uh, we don't have, present hate it doesn't mean that we're not necessarily part of a systemic issue that isn't necessarily of our making but it's certainly something that we can try to address um, so um, so um, and it, it's due to folks like yourself um, I follow you on on Twitter so it's due to folks like yourself help point people in the direction of various books or literature or podcasts and so on so it, it, that's really useful and it's certainly something we're trying to push out as well as an organization to point people in that, that direction yeah brilliant thank you no yeah come and find me on twitter under my uh my pseudonym excalibur with an a and a h at the end of it <laughs> it sounds like you might go back to excalibur anyway I'll though see. for dj i'm certainly wearing back your t-shirts again so we'll see what happens <laughs> I, i'd love to i've never seen you doing it so yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about um, doing some live streaming and that sort of stuff uh, as I sit here in this room with this resource behind me. Yeah. So we'll see. Watch this space. Great. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Matthew. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone as well who have, um, who have uh, joined us for this chat. There's one tomorrow as well, but I think Rachel come on to that. Um, someone's just mentioned the encounter. That's great. So, yeah, it was brilliant. Absolutely wonderful show. Fab. Hello, Can you Rachel. hear me this time? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Fab. I, I'm just going to quickly sign off by uh, letting you know uh, to all the participants on the call that we will be sending out um, a link so that you can watch this back. Along with that link, we'll send you some notes that we've made, some links to any of the literature referenced, um, some of the schemes that may have goes back to what Matthew said when we asked him to give us some of those tips about drilling oh, breaking up rage. I think oh. <laughs> I think as individuals throughout this pandemic we've been doing it. Sorry, I Salford has terrible internet. I mean, I can just sign off. Okay, I, th- I think what Rachel said, we'll, we'll email everyone and there'll be some details. Oh, hi Rach. And also, if you've opportunity to tune in tomorrow, um, I, the shoe's going to be on the other foot, so I'm going to be talking tomorrow. So, <laughs> talking about my career. Um, so, uh, with, with Kevin from home, who does a similar job to, to myself. Um, uh, so, do tune in for that if you have the opportunity Matthew if you've got two minutes do stay on the line as well so we can say bye properly but thank you so much really 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 appreciate it and thanks everyone else Uh, nice to have seen you at the beginning